am Srimati Karuna, the director of the Gandhi Memorial Center in Washington, D.C. I bring to you this series, Speaking of Gandhi, sharing the messages from the life of the Mahatma. Howard Thurman was an African-American author, philosopher, theologian, educator, and civil rights leader. He served as Dean of Rankin Chapel at Howard University from 1932 to 1944, and as Dean of Marshall Chapel at Boston University from 1953 to 1965. In 1944, he co-founded with Alfred Fisk the first major interracial, interdenominational church in the United States. It is well known that in 1935 and into 1936, Howard Thurman undertook what is known as a Pilgrimage of Friendship Tour in India. It was at the end of this tour that he would meet Mahatma Gandhi in Bardoli. He also met with Rabindranath Tagore at Shantiniketan and Kshiti Mohan Sen. Howard Thurman also encouraged his colleague, Benjamin Mays, to visit Gandhiji when he was to make a trip to India later that year. Although the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. never had the opportunity to meet Mahatma Gandhi, his mentors during his early years certainly impressed upon the young man the value of Gandhiji's experiments with truth and ahimsa. While a student at Morehouse College, King was introduced to the work of Mahatma Gandhi by then college president Benjamin Mays. After the death of Mahatma Gandhi, Mordecai Johnson visited India in 1949, and upon his return, he preached a sermon at Fellowship House in Philadelphia that deeply influenced Martin Luther King Jr. It is said that King was so inspired, he immediately went out and bought six books on Gandhi. King continued to be enlightened by Gandhiji's life and message when he was a doctoral student at Boston University by another man who had a deep influence on him. That was Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman and Sue Bailey Thurman, along with Edward Carroll and Fanola Carroll, were invited to lead the Negro delegation to Ceylon, India, and Burma in 1935-36. The main impetus for the Negro delegation came from the Reverend Augustine Rala Ram, the executive secretary of the Student Christian Movement of India, Burma, and Ceylon. We learn from the authors Quinton Dixie and Peter Eisenstadt in their book, Visions of a Better World, that Rala Ram was a friend and associate of Mahatma Gandhi, and when he visited Spelman College, presumably with Thurman in attendance, he told his audience that Gandhi's outlook and plans for action are identical in tone and purpose with those set forth by Christ, so certainly alike that many think of him as the living spirit of Christianity. When Rala Ram returned to India, the initial planning for the Negro delegation commenced. By 1933, there were already murmurs in American student Christian movement publications of plans afoot to sponsor a Negro delegation to India. Initially, Howard Thurman was reluctant to lead this delegation, but he soon changed his mind and he carried out a rather extensive preparation for the journey. He wrote to fellow delegate Grace Towns Hamilton in October 1934 the following words recited by Joe Tribulek. I am suggesting that as preparation for the work we will have to do there, that we spend most of the winter reading and studying in the following general fields, a detailed analysis of American culture, including the detailed history of two minorities, the American Negro and the American Indian, an analysis of the life and career of Jesus, 
Historically considered, giving particular attention to the role of Christian minorities through the ages. A study of comparative religions, paying definite attention to Islam and Hinduism. An analysis of current, major social philosophies in our time and their significance in the light of Christian ethics. A study of imperialism, both from Orthodox and Marxian point of view. And finally, an examination of the major factors in Indian history. Along with his reading and study, Howard Thurman undertook a great many personal interviews to prepare him for his journey, in which he would offer a series of lectures and sermons throughout South Asia. This included meetings with two of Gandhiji's associates who were in the U.S. on speaking tours at the time. Muriel Lester, and Madeline Slade, also known as Miraben. The first stop of the delegation was in Colombo. After two weeks in Ceylon, visiting all the major cities, the delegation made its way to what is today known as Teruchirapalli. They remained in South India for about a month, and by December 20th took a Christmas break from their busy tour, to stay in Darjeeling. Dixie and Eisenstadt tell us in their book that Thurman, always zealous for peak experiences of natural sublimity, got up early one morning, hiked in the darkness for several hours, and watched the sunrise on the foothills of Kanchenjunga, the third tallest mountain in the world. Suddenly the clouds parted, and for only a minute, the peak of Mount Everest was visible in the distance. Thurman would write of this experience 40 years later. It remains for me a transcendent moment of sheer glory and beatitude, when time, space, and circumstance evaporated, and when my naked spirit looked into the depths of what is forbidden for anyone to see. I would never, never be the same. The delegation then spent a week in Rangoon, Burma, before heading on to Calcutta and other cities in North India. The main task for the delegates was to talk, sermons, lectures, and public addresses before large and small gatherings. They led an exhausting journey across India. Their lectures included topics such as American Negro achievements, education of the Negro in America, youth and peace, and a particular favorite sermon of Thurman's, the tragedy of dull-mindedness, along with lectures and presentations of the work of contemporary black poets. Sue Bailey Thurman spoke on Negro women and women's organizations, as well as internationalism through music and internationalism in the beloved community. Dixie and Eisenstadt explain in their book, Visions of a Better World, that of the talks Thurman prepared especially for India was a lecture he called The Faith of the American Negro. Speaking was certainly the main responsibility for this distinguished delegation, but equally important was listening. A few conversations left indelible impressions on Howard Thurman, particularly those with Rabindranath Tagore, Kshitti Mohan Sen, and Mahatma Gandhi. Apparently, Howard Thurman had admired Tagore since his time at Rochester Theological Seminary. He viewed him as a kindred soul, a spiritual searcher, a person bridging two worlds. The delegation spent two days at Chantiniketan, January 16th and 17th in 1936. They had two meetings with Tagore, the first one along with students under a banyan tree, and then with Tagore in his house. Sue Bailey Thurman described the meeting with Tagore. She said, He was a being of such rare beauty, so elegant of form and face, so redolent of the world's great seers who reflect the glory of the lighted mind. And Howard Thurman said it was as if 
He were there and being initiated into the secret working of a great mind and a giant spirit. Now Thurman also had the opportunity to meet with Kshitimohan Sen, and though he had a bit of trouble and difficulty with his name, he never forgot their meeting. They spent the morning sitting on the floor talking about Christianity and Hinduism. At first, they had a spirited debate over differences, but later Thurman described their discussion as the most primary naked fusing of total religious experience with another human being of which I have ever been capable. It was as if we had stepped out of social, political, cultural frames of reference and allowed two human beings to unite on a ground of reality that was unmarked by separateness and differences. This was a watershed experience of my life. We had become a part of each other even as we remained essentially individual. I was able to stand secure in my place and enter into his place without diminishing myself or threatening him. The scholar and writer Kshiti Mohan Sen dedicated his book Medieval Mystics of India to all those who have felt the Supreme Spirit in rare moments of self-realization and who seek life's fulfillment in a love that transcends limitations of creeds, customs, and race. From this, we can understand how his meeting with Howard Thurman moved him so. Dixie and Eisenstadt write that since Hinduism finding its exemplars in humble weavers and cotton carters and in contemporary representatives of the mystical life in that of the bowels of Bengal, had much in common with Thurman's religion of an outcast, downtrodden, and politically marginal Jesus. They explained that although Thurman would always call himself a Christian, this would increasingly be more of a starting point than a destination, as he would wander increasingly widely in a search to realize the unity of God by transcending cultural barriers. His meeting with Shitti Mohan Sen was an important step in this journey. Now we come to the most impactful encounter Thurman had in India, both for himself and for generations to come. It was the meeting the Negro delegation had in late February 1936 with Mahatma Gandhi. From nearly the beginning of his involvement with the Negro delegation, Thurman had thoughts of meeting Gandhiji and a number of people went to great efforts to arrange it. By the 1920s, Gandhiji was hailed in the black press as a messiah and saint, and in 1921, the Chicago Defender called him the greatest man in the world today. Dixie and Eisenstadt write how Muriel Lester, a prominent leader in the Fellowship of Reconciliation and director of Kingsley Hall in London, was so excited to hear about the Negro delegation that she insisted Howard Thurman travel from Washington, D.C. to California at her expense to meet with her for a few hours. She promised to get in touch with Gandhiji, whom she had hosted in London, in 1931. In early 1935, Thurman convinced Madeline Slade, known as Miraben, to visit Howard University during a short American speaking tour. A daughter of a British admiral, she had joined Gandhi's ashram, and Thurman wanted to know why she had given up so much to follow Gandhiji. He also thought it was important that Miraben get to meet with black Americans and convey to Gandhi the substance of that meeting. Miraben, after this meeting at Howard University, told Thurman that he should definitely meet with Gandhiji while in India and that she promised to speak to Gandhiji about it. On September 9, 1935, Howard Thurman wrote to Mahatma Gandhi. 
For years I have read about you, and there are many things I should like to talk through with you, and covet the privilege very, very much. When Thurman arrived in Colombo, a postcard from Gandhiji awaited him, dated October 6, 1935. In it, Gandhiji wrote, Dear friend, I thank you for your letter of 9th September just received. I shall be delighted to have you and your friends whenever you come before the end of this year. After that, my movement will be uncertain, though you will be welcome at this place whenever you come. Reverend Rala Ram will be able to tell you how simply we live here. If therefore we cannot provide Western amenities of life, we will be making up for the deficiency by the natural warmth of our affection. Muriel Lester had prepared me to receive you here. Although there were delays in the delegation's attempts to meet with Gandhiji due to his falling ill and then later illness among the members of the delegation, it was finally arranged. While in Bombay, Gandhiji's next letter arrived in February 1936, inviting the delegation to meet him at Bardoli. And after a three-hour train trip on February 21st, they arrived at Navsari Station, where they were met by Mahadev Desai, Gandhiji's own personal secretary. Desai recorded the conversation of their meeting and later published it in the newspaper Harijan. Gandhiji had so much he wanted to discuss with the delegation that he was afraid there wouldn't be enough time. The group went into a tent and were invited to sit on the floor. Thurman later recounted in his autobiography that, To my amazement, the first thing Gandhi did was to reach under his shawl and take out an old watch saying, I apologize, but we must talk by the watch because we have much to talk about, and you have only three hours before you have to leave to take your train back to Bombay. As Gandhiji began the conversation with questions of all sorts, Thurman reflected that, Never in my life have I been part of that kind of examination with persistent pragmatic questions about American Negroes, about the course of slavery, and how we had survived it. Gandhiji asked Thurman about voting rights, lynching, discrimination, public school education, the churches, and how they functioned. His questions covered what Thurman described as the entire sweep of our experience in American society. Dixie and Eisenstadt write that Thurman gave Gandhiji a brief overview of black history since emancipation and talked about Booker T. Washington, W.E.B. Du Bois, and explained the consequences of segregation in education and other areas of life, spoke of the history of Howard University, and made a point of mentioning to Gandhiji that Howard University's president was among his greatest supporters. Gandhiji then asked Thurman if the prejudice against color was growing or dying out. And Thurman gave a measured response, saying it was difficult to say, but... In one place, things look much improved, whilst in another, the outlook is still dark. Somewhat surprisingly, Thurman thought the greatest progress had been made in the South where among Southern white students, there is a disposition to improve upon the attitude of their forebears, and there was some small amelioration in general racial climate. However, he argued, the migrants to the North were dealing with the brunt of the depression, as well as the anger from whites worried about losing their jobs. The economic question is acute everywhere, and in many of the industrial centers in the Midwest, the prejudice against the Negro shows itself in its ugliest form. The conversation continued into many subject areas, including religion, and Mahadev Desai wrote that the whole discussion led to many a question and cross-question, during which the guests had an occasion to see that Gandhiji's principle of equal respect for all religions 
was no theoretical formula, but a practical creed. The conversation then turned, in the words of Desai, to the main thing that had drawn the distinguished members to Gandhiji. His philosophy of ahimsa, or nonviolence, and satyagraha, soul force. Thurman asked of Gandhiji, Is nonviolence, from your point of view, a form of direct action? And Gandhiji replied, It is not one form. It is the only form. Nonviolence, Gandhiji said, does not exist without an active expression of it. And indeed, one cannot be passively nonviolent. Gandhiji insisted that nonviolence is a force which is more positive than electricity and subtler and more pervasive than the ether. And he expanded thus. We are surrounded in life by strife and bloodshed, life living upon life. But some seer who ages ago penetrated the center of truth said, it was not through strife and violence, but through nonviolence that man can fulfill his destiny and his duty to his fellow creatures. At the center of nonviolence is a force which is self-acting. Ahimsa, he told the visiting Christian delegation, meant love in the Pauline sense, yet something more. Ahimsa expresses a force superior to all forces put together. One person who can express Ahimsa in life exercises a force superior to all the forces of brutality. Thurman's question of whether it was possible for a single human to embody Ahimsa provoked the following conversation with Gandhiji, saying, It is possible. Perhaps your question is more universal than you mean. Isn't it possible, you mean to ask, for one single Indian, for instance, to resist the exploitation of 300 million Indians? Or... Do you mean the onslaught of the whole world against a single individual personally? Yes, that is one half of the question. I wanted to know if one man can hold the whole of violence at bay. And Gandhiji responded, If he cannot, you must take it that he is not a true representative of Ahimsa. And Thurman asked Gandhiji how to train individuals or communities in this difficult art of Ahimsa. And Gandhiji replied, There is no royal road except through living the creed in your own life, which itself must be a living sermon. Of course, the expressions in one's own life presuppose great study and tremendous perseverance. If, for the mastering of the physical sciences, you have to devote a whole lifetime, how many lifetimes may be needed for mastering the greatest spiritual force that mankind has known? But why worry, even if it means several lifetimes? For this is the only permanent thing in life. If this is the only thing that counts, then whatever effort you bestow on mastering it is well spent. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and everything else shall be added unto you. Gandhiji said, The kingdom of heaven is Ahimsa. Gandhiji said, I am a very poor specimen of the practice of nonviolence, and my answer may not convince you, but I am striving very hard, and even if I do not succeed fully in this life, my faith will not diminish. Neither Gandhiji nor the members of the delegation wanted the conversation to end. Sue Bailey Thurman requested that Gandhiji come to America. To this invitation, he responded, How I wish I could come, he told the delegation, but he felt he couldn't do so. Before he gave what he described, a demonstration here of all that I have been saying. I must make good the message here before I bring it to you. I do not say that I am defeated, but I still have to perfect myself. 
you may be sure that the moment I feel the call within me, I shall not hesitate. And finally, Thurman said, Much of the peculiar background of our own life in America is our own interpretation of Christian religion. When one goes through the pages of the hundreds of Negro spirituals, striking things are brought to mind which remind me of all you have told us today. Before they left Gandhiji, the delegation sang the song, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Which, it is said, that Gandhiji had thought provided the root experience of the entire human race under the spread of the healing wings of suffering. And they also sang, We are climbing up Jacob's ladder. At the end of a long silence that followed the singing, Gandhiji offered his final comment. It may be through the Negroes, he said, that the unadulterated message of nonviolence will be delivered to the world. I look forward to sharing with you more messages each week from the life of Mahatma Gandhi. As he said, my life is my message. Vaishnava Jai